No, I'm almost there. Okay, can you guys see the title slide now? Yep, we're good to go. Okay, can you see it in presenter mode just to make sure? Uh, it, it, it's in the correct mode. Okay, all right, very good. All right, you guys, so good morning. Um, my name is Alana Murphy. I trained at Columbia, New York. That's why I'm having residency flashbacks. I'm now in Jefferson and Philadelphia um, doing mostly female urology, FPMRS. Um, so overactive bladder is definitely a component of my practice. All right, so we'll go through this morning and we'll talk about, we're gonna review some basics. We'll talk about basic evaluation of overactive bladder. We'll go through the AUA uh, recommended treatment algorithm. Then we'll go on and we'll spend the most time talking about the different options for refractory overactive bladder symptoms. And we'll finish up with just a couple few cases and we'll leave some time at the end to go over some questions. All right, so what does it mean to have overactive bladder? So in order to have overactive bladder, according, according to International Condom Society, you have to have urgency. So that is the key component of overactive bladder. Now, urgency can be a difficult concept for patients to define, and we have to help them through that um, sometimes. But what it is is a compelling need to void that's difficult to defer. Again, patients don't come in using that terminology, so you have to help them through you know, discovering the diagnosis in the office. It is typically associated with urinary frequency and nocturia. It may or may not be associated with urgency and continence. We know that the prevalence and the severity of overactive bladder increases with age, but it's really important to note that this can also happen for, for young people as well. I have quite a number of 20 year olds in my practice who are also suffering from, from debilitating overactive bladder symptoms. And it's important to remember that overactive bladder is a clinical diagnosis. So you don't have to use urodynamics to make this diagnosis. In fact, oftentimes urodynamics is not indicated in the initial evaluation. So frequency is very subjective. It's simply the complaint avoiding more often than what the patient previously deemed normal. So in theory, you could have a patient who just voided three times a day, now is voiding six times and comes in complaining of frequency. You know, we don't typically see that in real life, if you sort of have to put a number to it, typically eight would be the rough rule of thumb in terms of you know, more than eight voids a day, we would consider frequency. Urgency and continence, even though the difference between stress and urgency and continence may be sort of easy for us to understand, it's sometimes really challenging for patients to understand the delineation between those two different types of incontinence. So urgent incontinence is typically patients coming in saying, I can't make it to the bathroom in time before I start to leak. I used to have warning time, now I don't. So you obviously have to interpret this lay language. All right, so with any patient, with any new patient, we start off with a history and a physical. Um, during the history, key components to review would be, again, clarifying the type of incontinence, the type of lower urinary tract dysfunction the patient's suffering from. Going over the severity and the duration, has this been going on for two days, and maybe it's due to a UTI, or has this been going on for years, and the patient's finally coming in to, to seek treatment. It's also important to to elucidate the previous evaluations and treatments the patients have had. If they've already gone through the first couple of steps of the treatment algorithm, then you know where to jump in with them. Likewise, sometimes we get patients who come in who've had more advanced therapies and have skipped the more basic steps of the treatment algorithm and we have to almost start from the beginning with them. During a physical, you want to look at a BMI. Obesity has been linked to overactive bladder symptom severity and bother. Likewise, patients who have had surgeries such as gastric bypass or significant weight loss have been shown to improve their overactive bladder symptoms. A urinalysis is recommended for all initial evaluation OAB patients because you want to make sure there's not something else to cause their overactive bladder symptoms, something like a urinary tract infection or something that perhaps would prompt a hematuria evaluation to find other pathology. PVR is not required for all patients on initial evaluation, except if the patient has an urgent bladder or if they come in complaining of concomitant voiding symptoms where you're worried about, are they emptying their bladder? Is there any degree of outward flow obstruction there? And how about exam? You know, when we examine stress incontinence patients, we're physically looking for stress incontinence. We're asking these patients to cough, bear down, do valsalva maneuvers and looking for stress incontinence. Overactive bladder patients are a little bit different. A lot of times we, we aren't lucky enough to catch overactive bladder incontinence on exam, but you can look for signs of bladder outlet obstruction. So say for instance, in a male patient, you'd be looking for prosthetic enlargement. For a female patient, you'd be looking for evidence of outlet obstruction, such as a vaginal mass or degree of anterior prolapse. All right, what about bladder diaries? I have a love-hate relationship with bladder diaries. They can be really, really helpful. Um, we ask patients to fill out a three-day diary, ideally you know, tracking what they're drinking, how often they're voiding, how often they're having incontinence episodes, ideally how much they're voiding. 
Um, if I get a patient to come back in having completed one or two days, I'm thrilled and I think it's a, it's a total victory. So they can be really patient dependent. If you've got a really compliant patient who's paying attention and does a great diary, it can be a powerful tool for them to actually see on paper in black and white how much they're actually drinking, how, how many times they're actually voiding and episodes of incontinence. Uh, and again, it's just important to note that for the initial evaluation of sort of your standard idiopathic overactive bladder patient, your dynamics, cystoscopy, and imaging would not be indicated. All right, so AUA has set forth treatment guidelines. They were most recently updated in 2019. Um, so a number of you guys may have seen this lovely use of these AUA treatment algorithms, right? So for this algorithm, it starts off with our basic history and physical and patient education. It walks through first line therapy, which is behavioral modifications, onto second line pharmacologic interventions and medications. And where we're gonna again spend more of our time today is on these third line therapies for refractory overactive bladder symptoms. All right, so let's just do a quick review of the first and second line treatments. So first line treatment, behavioral therapy. This has no risk associated whatsoever, so it should be offered to all patients, all comers. Um, this is reduction in bladder irritants. Um, so some of you guys might be sipping on caffeine, caffeinated beverages right now. So caffeine tends to be a big culprit for exacerbating overactive bladder symptoms. Um, alcohol, spicy acidic foods, um, there are some sort of big, big players here that we really want to talk to patients about and we really want to get them to work towards minimizing their bladder irritants. They don't have to completely cut them out, but they have to be aware of what they're drinking and minimize the stuff that's going to irritate their bladder. Fluid management is also an important principle here. I think most of us sort of think about, well, what about the patient who comes in and is drinking two gallons of water? Well, that's, that's kind of an easy fix for frequency. You have to get them to cut back on their fluids. But you also have to be careful about the patients who are completely dehydrating themselves because of their bothersome OED symptoms. So we want to make sure that, you know, we sort of catch people on, on both ends of the spectrum and bring them back towards the middle. Again, this is where bladder diary is super helpful. Sometimes patients come in and you ask them, you know, how many cups of coffee do you drink a day? What else do you drink in terms of fluids? And they give you sort of a blank stare. Um, and it's true. We, sometimes these sort of day-to-day -day behavioral things we don't really think about and when we're put on the spot it's hard to to sort of give the give the physician provider a good answer so this is where the bladder diary is really helpful and i put down here you know set realistic treatment goals and this is not obviously specific to overactive bladder this goes for pretty much everything that we're treating it is so important to remember to set realistic treatment goals to uh, sort of really figure out what bothers the patient and to kind of guide them in terms of what might be a realistic treatment expectation Patients come in oftentimes and they want to be 20 again um, and they want to have a 20 year old bladder and you really have to sort of set them up for the fact that we will get you better, but we may not make you 20 again. All right, so what about second line therapies? This is moving on to oral medications, pharmacologic therapy, and we really have two main categories that we can offer patients. We have our anticholinergics and our beta agonists, our beta 3 agonists. And the primary risk here is side effects, right? Sort of we're talking about medication interactions and side effects from the medications that we pre uh, prescribe patients. The nice thing is these are generally reversible uh, with cessation of the medication. All right, so I'm including both trade names and generic names here. Um, obviously on tests, you guys were given generic names, but I think we're sort of more comfortable in day-to-day -day discussing patients who are talking with trade names. Okay, so we have seven options available to us. Six of them are in the anticholinergic or what we would call the anti-muscarinic category. Um, Side effects here would be things such as dry mouth, dry energy eyes, constipation, blurry vision, dyspepsia, or reflux, and impaired cognitive function, which is we're learning more and more about with even short-term use of anticholinergics, you can see some impaired cognitive function. So what are some contraindications? Obviously medication class sensitivity. Uncontrolled narrow angle glaucoma is, is a contraindication for anticholinergics, um, and that may require you tracking down the patient's ophthalmologist to sort of have a better understanding of what type of glaucoma they have. Um, most of my patients have no idea, um, so I ha usually have to track down that information myself. Gastroparesis would also be a contraindication, and again, cognitive impairment. So anticholinergics are not a great treatment choice for patients who are coming in with baseline cognitive impairment older elderly patients who already have polypharmacy who are at risk for cognitive impairment. Um, so something really important to consider, again, as we have more and more evidence that this is happening even with short-term use of anticholinergics. All right, so mirror backgrounds, a beta-3 agonist, and it sits in a class by itself right now in the US. Efficacy is similar to anticholinergics. There's no data that says that one medication is better than another, really, um, in terms of where to start. 
Side effects would be elevation in blood pressure, headaches and rhinitis, uh, contraindications, again, medication class sensitivity, and uncontrolled hypertension. So if you have a patient comes in and they've got a systolic of 180 and they're on two, you know, already on two antihypertensives, that's not a great candidate for my background trial. All right, so if patients fail to respond to behavioral modifications and medication trials, then they cross over into what we would call a refractory overactive bladder. And now as we move into third line treatments. So third line treatments actually can all contain some sort of type of neuromodulation therapy. The three modalities that we have available to us currently are percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, or sometimes people might refer to this as percutaneous tibial neuromodulation, a sacral neuromodulation, and some chemodenervation with botulinum toxin injections in the bladder. Okay, so I just want to take a quick pause here. Even though before I said, listen, urodynamic cystoscopy is not, a, not an important or indicated component of the initial evaluation of overactive bladder, it's important to notice that now you have to consider urodynamics and cystoscopy in select number of patients. So urodynamics definitely would be appropriate here for, again, neurogenic patients, neurogenic bladder patients, any patients who you have concern for outlet obstruction, so if they have obstructive symptoms, if they have incomplete bladder emptying, if they've had previous pelvic reconstruction, um, urodynamics would be indicated here. A classic example that I see not infrequently is a patient who's had a sling for a female patient with a sling for stress incontinence um, that is perhaps obstructed. She comes in complaining of her overactive bladder symptoms, but it's the obstruction that really is sort of the, the root of the problem. So urodynamics would be really important for me to tease that out at this point. Sometimes patients come in and they give you a really crummy history. Um, you're not really able to tease out what type of bladder dysfunction they're experiencing, and this is where urodynamics can also be helpful. And it's, it's, it's okay to consider urodynamics in patients who are moving from sort of simple, uncomplicated overactive bladder to refractory overactive bladder, so you, before you're going to consider a third-line therapy. Now, I, I feel very comfortable sending patients for PTNS without urodynamics, but I sort of make it a manda uh, mandatory test before they undergo certainly botulinum toxin injections, and most of my sacral neuromodulation patients also undergo urodynamic evaluation. Cystoscopy also indicated here for neurogenic patients. Again, any concern for outlet obstruction, it'll give you that visual evaluation of the lower urinary tract. And again, patients who've had previous pelvic reconstruction. Just to kind of throw in one quick example again, if I have a patient who's had a prolapse repair or a previous procedure with a foreign body, I always want to scope that patient to make sure they don't have a foreign body in their bladder, and that's actually the culprit for their refractory overactive bladder symptoms. All right, so let's jump into PTNS. So PTNS is actually not a new treatment modality. It was first described in 87. Um, so I'm not sure what you guys were doing in 87, but you probably weren't urologists. Okay, so PTNS relies on stimulation of the posterior tibial nerve, and that is part of the tibial nerve, which is a mixed peripheral nerve. It gets roots from L4 to S3. And you guys may not have actually gotten to see PTNS live and in person all that much. Um, in residency, we typically don't, uh, you know, a lot of our residents don't get sort of a lot of firsthand experience with PTNS. But it's important to know that it has sensory motor components. The sensory would uh, provide cutaneous efferents for the sole and the heel. So sometimes during treatment, patients may sort of note a tingling sensation along this distribution. And it also provides flexion of the great toes. So you can see the toes flex during, during the uh, stimulation. And that's okay. That's to be expected. So again, we sort of have retrograde stimulation of the posterior tibial nerve in a retrograde fashion. And no one knows the exact mechanism, but we know it is a neuromodulation of the innervation for the bladder and the pelvic floor muscles. We have two current systems that are available to us in the US. That's urgent PC and neuro, which is made by Medtronic. The protocol though is the same, regardless of what <clears throat> treatment system you're using, the protocol is the same. So we take a very small 34, gauge needle and we place it sort of superior to the medium alveolus and we're trying to get in close proximity to this posterior tibial nerve. It's connected to an external battery source and patients have a 30 minute simulation session once a week for typically 12 weeks. That's a treatment course. Maintenance therapy can vary a little bit by institution but typically it is once a month. Okay, so does it really work? I think that there is an appropriate degree of skepticism, um, perhaps against, certainly against amongst our patients. When I first tell patients about PTNS, they sort of give me a puzzled look and say, is that really gonna work? Um, and there's also a degree of skepticism, I think, amongst primary care physicians, perhaps, who receive consult notes back from us that say, you know, what are you doing to my patient? This sounds sort of strange. Um, and even perhaps amongst urologists um, who, who say, does, you know, does this really work? Does this have data behind it? Um, so in fact, it does. 
Uh, there's been over 50 studies that have looked at PTNS in terms of efficacy and tra looking at pre treatment protocols. Uh, we've had level one evidence supporting PTNS since 2010. So this is the first uh, level one study that came out for PTNS. This is a summit trial. And this was a randomized control trial over 12 weeks. And they took patients and they randomized them to either receive PTNS or standardized medical therapy, so medications. They had 220 patients involved in the study and they were not allowed to receive concomitant therapy. So even these days in practical, sort of practical speaking, we may have patients having undergoing PTNS and taking an overactive bladder medication at the same time. This particular study said, no, nope, you either get placebo or you get PTNS. So they did a great job of setting up their sham protocol here. Patients, the sham protocol here on the right, these patients actually had a 34 gauge needle each needle place. They were hooked up to sort of a grounding pad. They had a sheet where they weren't able to look down at their foot. Um, so they did a great job of sort of creating a sham group here. And if we look at sort of the, <clears throat> some, some of the outcome data, we found that there was a significant improvement in the PTNS treatment group for overall bladder um, OEB symptom improvement, and then also broken down by urgency, frequency, and urgency incontinence episodes. So this is sort of a, sort of a number that we see often here. 55% of patients felt that they were either moderately or markedly improved after PTNS as compared to only 20% of the sham group. So what about long-term efficacy? Does this work in the long-term or is this a sort of a more of a 12-week short-term therapy? Well, there is data to support long-term therapy for PTNS. The STEP trial looked at um, a 36-month protocol. They had 29 patients who were able to follow through the protocol and they had an average, an average of one maintenance treatment per month. Now here, this is going to be symptom severity, the dashed line here. So we can see this is the initial 12 week course where they have improvement in their symptom severity. And then there is sustained efficacy over the 30 month, 36 month period. This is looking at quality of life. And again, that's sort of initial increase in quality of life improvement and sustained over the 36 month period. So there is, there is evidence to support long-term use of PTNS. All right, so what are some contraindications? Contraindications for PTNS would be pregnancy, just because we're never going to study it, and implantable pacemakers or defibrillators. And I always put time here, and I think this is a really important thing to consider. These patients have a treatment session once a week for 12 weeks in a row. That's a lot of time. If you have a patient who is sort of participating, obviously this is sort of pre-COVID talk, right? So participating in sort of the the economy is sort of still working, going out every day and has a busy schedule, this is not a great patient for PTNS. So they really need to be able to commit to come in to see you once a week for 12 weeks. Some relative contraindications would be peripheral neuropathy, peripheral edema, and neurogenic bladder. Um, I just want to go over some future directions because there is some stuff, some sort of exciting stuff that might be coming down the road and that you guys might be actually using and implementing when you get out into practice. So I think the big question for us is, you know, PTNS is such a low risk <clears throat> procedure and relatively easy to do. Can this, be, can this be done at home? And it's important to know this is only investigational at this point, but I just wanna show you guys a couple quick options that might be available to us in the future. So one thing that's under investigation is something called an electroceutical coin, the e-coin. So they have some pilot, uh, pilot data looking at the use of the e-coin. And what the e-coin is, look up here, it's a small little disc. It's about the size of a nickel. Um, it's placed in the office, inserted in the office over the posterior tibial nerve. So these patients go home, they do a 30 minute stimulation session. Um, based on the pilot say they would do it every other day for 12 weeks and then go to every other week, so about fifth, every 15 days. So the pilot study had 49 patients. And we can see that there is some promising initial data here. This is looking at specifically urge incontinence episodes. Um, so from baseline, you know, they're getting some, some efficacy data here that they're going to continue to look at. So this might be an option for us at a later date. Another system that's also under development is the Renova stimulator. This is a small sort of obviously bar-like stimulator. Um, it can be inserted in the office or you can take someone to the operating room to place the stimulator. And again, the idea is that you want it to sit in close proximity to the posterior tibial nerve here. Um, so the pilot study was actually just published this year. Um, they had 20 patients, they followed for three years. They did 30 minute daily stimulation sessions um, using this lovely little anklet here that is uh, placed over the stimulator. Um, and so this is sort of more, more frequent stimulation, right? So this is daily, daily stimulation. But over <clears throat> the 36 months, they did see some efficacy, again, in terms of pad usage decreasing and the number of urgency and incontinence episodes decreasing. So some, also some promising data here. Um, to look for in the future. All right, so let's switch gears. Let's go from PTNS to sacral neuromodulation. Uh, sacral neuromodulation, also not a new therapy. Uh, it's first approved by the FDA in 1997. Um, 
as a system and urology started using it a little bit later. So mechanism, again, we don't understand the exact mechanism, but we know that is there is a stimulation or neuromodulation of the sacral nerves that go to the bladder, the sphincter, and the pelvic floor muscles. We have two systems that are currently available to us in the US, that's InterStim and the more recently approved Axonic system. All right, so what are some FDA approved indications? So as urologists, we most likely see patients coming in for urgency, frequency, and urgency incontinence, right, over rectal bladder symptoms. But we also, as urologists, will use sacral neuromodulation systems for idiopathic non-obstructive urinary retention and for fecal incontinence as well. Now, it's important here to note that this, the definition of success when we talk about sacral neuromodulation is greater than 50% improvement. And this, again, this is not specific necessarily to sacral neuromodulation. If you think back to when we were talking about the evaluation of the OAB patient, again, setting realistic treatment goals is so important. You're not going to get a patient 100% improved, and you want to set that treatment expectation and treatment goal early on when you're first meeting the OAB patient. So for sacral neuromodulation patients, we're going to very, be very clear that we're looking at greater than 50% improvement, and that to us would be considered a success. Okay, so this is looking at treatment protocols for implantation of a sacral neuromodulator. There's two different ways to jump into this treatment pathway. So two different ways that patients can be put through the protocol. The first is having patients undergo a temporary lead test in the office, which you guys may have heard of as a PE and may have even gotten the chance to participate in. This is an office-based temporary trial of um, sacral neuromodulation. If patients have a successful trial, then they're able to just go straight to the operating room once for a lead and battery implantation. If they have less than 50% improvement in their OAB symptoms, then they're shuttled from this temporary test to a stage protocol. Now the stage protocol requires two trips to the operating room. The first of which would be for a lead implantation and a connection to an external battery source. They walk around for a couple weeks, and then if they have greater than 50% improvement, they come back for their second stage, which is the battery implantation. So two different ways to bring patients through this protocol, and they can enter at either the temporary trial or the stage protocol. All right, so the temporary lead test, again, I think most of you guys have probably heard of this as a PE, a peripheral nerve evaluation. This is office based, so we're just using local anesthesia here um, to place a wire and hook it up to an external battery source. You can do this procedure with or without fluoroscopy. I've done it both ways, um, and it, it, it doesn't require you to have a CR in the office, so it's nice. You can just use bony landmarks and measurements to do this. Okay, so there's some pros and cons. Um, the nice thing about doing a temporary test is that if it is successful, you can take the op to patients to the operating room just once and just do a single stage procedure. So put the permanently the you know the quadrupolar time quadrupolar lead and the battery at the same time, um, which is sort of nice. If the, some of the cons about this procedure, poor tolerance of office procedures. We all try to gauge our patients' pain tolerance before we take them to the operating room or you know, book them for any type of procedure, but sometimes we're actually very wrong. Um, so in the past six months, I've had a patient who came in for a PE, and and we just put the marker, I put the marker, the surgical marker on her skin and she was about to jump off the bed. So that was poor patient selection on my part. Um, so sometimes we get surprised and patients aren't able to tolerate um, these office procedures and then they should just go to the operating room for a stage procedure. Lead migration is something that we contend with. The wires that we put in, even with these, this newly approved wire that came out from Medtronic, they're still relatively flimsy. And even if we tell patients to sort of take it easy and limit their physical activity, we can have to contend with lead migration during the trial period. In addition, sort of one of the things that's almost most challenging is patients have the ability then to compare their temporary stimulation with their long-term stimulation. So there can sometimes be a honeymoon period during the p &E where patients feel like their overactive bladder is dramatically improved, they feel fantastic, they wish they had done this years before, and then you give them the permanent implant and they're constantly comparing that to the p &E. um, So that can be a challenge to deal with on the long-term basis for us in the office. All right, so what about the stage procedure? Um, so a stage one or sort of a chronic lead test. So this is an outpatient procedure. Um, take patients to the operating room with some sort of anesthesia. Typically, we just use sedation. Here, we're placing the tine quadrupoder lead, so the fancy permanent lead. And here, we have fluoroscopy on our side to help with proper lead placement. So again, pros and cons. Um, so the tines actually help prevent the lead migration. These are longer trials, these are about two week trials on average. So the patient, even though they're limiting their physical activity, they're less likely to have lead migration. 
<clears throat> and it also can prevent comparison. So if you take a patient right to stage procedure, they'll never know anything except for the stimulation that they're receiving from their permanent lead. So they won't have that honeymoon period to compare to. Um, obviously, the negative here would be that it takes two trips to the operating room, um, and especially for patients who have higher you know, perioperative comorbidity risk, that's sort of something to seriously consider. All right, so we know, um, you guys know that, uh, I would imagine that a, a good number of you guys have been able to participate in a separate neuromodulation procedure in the, in the operating room. So, you know, we're targeting the S3 foramen to target the S3 nerve root. This here, we'd love to test on this sometimes with in-service. Um, so what are we looking for in terms of both motor and sensory responses? So S3 is going to look for an anal pelvic floor bellow, so bellows response and gray toe flexion. Um, if you were to say light, light sedation or ask a patient what you're feeling in terms of sensation, they should be describing some sort of stimulation around the base of the penis or the vagina, that perirectal area, or what I sort of refer to sometimes as the bicycle seat. Um, so you imagine those sort of bicycle seat distribution. That's where you'd be looking for stimulation. All right, so fluoroscopy is, is always a welcome um, helper in the operating room because we know more and more that correct lead placement really does help um, in terms of long-term efficacy for sacral modulation, reducing sort of frequency of reprogramming episodes. So fluoroscopy is really important for us to get nice and medial on the foramen and make sure that our contact points are accepted where we want to be and following the nerve root in this sort of medial to lateral orientation here. Okay, so just very briefly, let's just go, go over a quick little bit of efficacy data for sacral neuromodulation. So INSIGHT trial was a randomized trial where they took 147 patients and they randomized them to either receive sacral neuromodulation or standard medical therapy, some medications. Um, they had six month follow up and they show here both in the intention to treat and as treated group, they had significant improvement in overactive bladder symptoms um, severity for patients undergoing sacral neuromodulation. So longer term therapy, the INSIGHT phase two looked at 36 month follow up and a majority of those patients, day 272, majority of them finish up the 36 month uh, follow up. And you can see here sustained efficacy in terms of overactive bladder symptom severity. What about quality of life? You know, sometimes if patients' bladder diaries improve, that doesn't necessarily mean that they feel better or they feel their quality of life has improved. Um, so this is again, the INSIGHT two phase two. Uh, long-term sacral neuromodulation therapy, and they see it at 36 months, about 80% of patients still feel that they are at least improved or greatly improved in terms of quality of life, and about 20% of patients um, are, are not experiencing that same improvement in quality of life. All right, so what about complications of sacral neuromodulation? There's sort of three that we are most concerned with. So device infection, sort of our number one concern. Um, majority of these patients, uh, if they can't be treated with sort of, if you don't catch it early and be able to treat it with oral antibiotics, they go to explantation. Um, and then there's consideration for either going down the road of a different treatment modality or considering reimplantation at a later date. Patients can experience loss or lack of efficacy. Um, and then you're counseling them regarding lead revision or an explantation. And bothersome stimulation, this can be from the get go, this can develop over time. Again, those patients would be counseled regarding lead revision um, to, to eliminate that bothersome stimulation um, or explantation and just moving on to a different treatment modality. Some contraindications to sacral neuromodulation, pacemaker, defibrillar um, implantation or pregnancy. And just important to note that we do need to hold anticoagulation in the periapo setting here for, for complete implantation. All right, so what are some future directions? What's going to change in terms of sacral neuromodulation? So again, we have two systems that are currently available to us, InterStem and Axonics. And the, the, the things that we're gonna see change over time are size, MRI compatibility, and battery life. So this here is a comparison between InterStem and Axonics. So the <clears throat> current, currently available systems are InterStem, this are more than the more traditionally used to using, and Axonics, this is the newer, the more newer approved device. Now, InterStem does have a new device that it is awaiting FDA approval, and you'll see that size differential decrease. The new InterStem is going to be smaller, more on the line of Axonics in terms of the battery size. Um, MRI compatibility will also change. As it currently stands, an InterStem is compatible with a head MRI performed with a 1.5 Tesla magnet, and Axonics is considered more fully MRI compatible. So a patient could have a head MRI with either 1.5 or a three Tesla magnet, or even a full body MRI with a 1.5 Tesla magnet. Now in terms of battery life, InterStem as, it's, as it currently is, is not rechargeable. So it has about a four to five battery, um, four to five year battery life as compared to 15 year for Axonics because it is rechargeable. Now I think there's a lot of excitement regarding 
the presence of a rechargeable battery and offering that. I know patients in the office are very excited about it. I think if we had been to the AUA this year, there would have been buzz about it um, from those of us who do a lot of sacral neuromodulation. But I think it's important to sort of keep an eye on the fact that it may not be the best choice for certain patients. Um, so rechargeable, it, their patient selection is certainly a factor here. So who might be a good candidate for a rechargeable, rechargeable battery? So certainly a motivated patient, a patient who is going to actually be compliant with recharging their device. If you implant a sacral neuromodulator, but then your patient never recharges it, well, there goes your efficacy. Um, so you really need a motivated, compliant patient. Patients who have to run their devices at higher levels of stimulation, so they might be burning through their battery um, at a faster rate than others who are blowing at, running at a lower a level of stimulation might be a good candidate for a rechargeable battery. Um, and those who have increased comorbidities, increased perioperative risk, patients who you don't necessarily want to have to take back to the operating room you know, every four to five years to put in a new battery, those might be good candidates for rechargeable units as well. All right, patients who are poor candidates for a rechargeable battery. You're, so you're a non-compliant patient. Again, if they don't charge it, it's not gonna work. Um, so you really wanna think hard about patients who you have a suspicion or a documented pattern of non-compliance. Patients who have poor technical knowledge. Can you imagine if a patient called the office every single time they had to recharge their device because they just didn't understand how to do it or they weren't making the right connection? That could be a real challenge for an outpatient practice. Um, and patients who are forgetful. I think we all have patients uh, and people in our personal lives perhaps who are very forgetful and lose a lot of things. If your patient keeps losing their recharging um, unit, then that's a problem. Um, and that's a poor candidate for a rechargeable battery. All right, you guys. Um, okay, so we're still good for time. We'll have room for questions. Let's sort of go on to botulinum toxin, right? So botulinum toxin is the most potent neurotoxin known to man. There are various different strains of clostridium botulinum. The one that you guys are most familiar with Botox is on a botulinum toxin A. Um, there, are other, there are other types of botulinum toxins that are used even by urologists in Europe, but again, the one that we're most familiar with using is on a botulinum toxin A. In terms of FDA approval, in 2011, it was approved for refractory neurogenic activity. And then subsequently in 2013, we received approval for refractory obrecta bladder, so idiopathic patients with urgency, frequency, and urgency incontinence. Okay. Um, so also sort of a nice little test question is, you know, how does it work? What's the mechanism for botulinum toxin? Well, it provides presynaptic, <clears throat> inhibits presynaptic release of acetylcholine. So that provides downstream keener denervation with reduction in muscle contractility and reduced afferent input as well. All right, so how do we perform botulinum toxin injections? This can be done either in the office or in the operating room. Um, so I perform the majority of my Botox injections um, in the office setting um, in terms of what, breaking this down by gender. So female patients, I perform all those injections with a rigid cystoscope. For females who are awake in the office, a rigid scope is well tolerated. You don't have to use a flexible scope. Um, for male patients who are sensate, then we'll use a flexible scope. Um, so again, since sensate males in the office typically will use a flexible scope um, with a longer a needle to inject the, the botulinum toxin for female patients, rigoscope is absolutely fine. If you're taking to the, the patient to the operating room, typically we'll use some sort of anesthesia. That means they weren't able to tolerate the procedure in the office. Um, so the majority of those patients who are going to the operating room are going to get some sort of sedation. Okay, so it's important to check a urinalysis before administering botulinum toxin, before doing that injection procedure. You wanna make sure the patient doesn't have evidence of acute cystitis. Um, that would make you pause, treat the UTI, and have them come back on another day for their procedure. It's also very important to base, um, to get a baseline PBR on these patients. Um, so I know we mentioned that PBR doesn't necessarily have to be part of the initial evaluation for an idiopathic patient, but you definitely now at this point wanna make sure that you have a baseline PBR documented. And we'll talk about why that's important in just a second here. In terms of dosing, uh, so if for idiopathic patients, we typically start at 100 units. For neurogenic patients, we'll typically start at 200 units. But we, I, I give patients, I say, listen, there's a wide range in terms of efficacy. I typically say, hey, listen, six to 12 months from now, this is going to wear off and you're, need, you're going to need to come back. Typically for neurogenic patients, we'll sort of err on the side of a shorter period of efficacy um, or more in the order of six months. <clears throat> 
So I'm just going to give you a quick little background about where do these doses come from. You know, 100 units for idiopathic and 200 units for neurogenic just didn't come out of the air. There is some data to support those treatment decisions. Um, so for neurogenic patients, this is, this is a randomized controlled trial looking at neurogenic bladder patients who had either MS or spinal cord injury. They took 275 patients and randomized them to placebo, 200 or 300 units of botulinum toxin. Um, and you can see here in terms of efficacy for incontinence, reduction in incontinence episodes, the 200 and the 300 unit doses, which is the blue and the orange here, actually performed, sort of had a relatively similar performance as compared to placebo. And this is looking at quality of life here. Look at, there's, they're so close, right, in terms of 200 and 300 units. So there is some data, again, that sort of supports how do we come up with this 200 unit uh, dose. And obviously there's, there's a number of other studies in this literature. This is just sort of touching the tip of the iceberg here. For idiopathic patients, um, there's a randomized study that took th over 300 patients with idiopath idiopathic OAB and randomized them to receive anywhere from placebo injections or nothing to all the way up to 300 units of botulinum toxin. Um, and so they have sort of a sort of a dose response uh, here to, for urgency and incontinence reduction. And if you look here, this is again sort of quality of life. We can see here the the box, the boxes, the here is this the 50 unit dose, and then we can see greater clustering of the 100, 150, 200, 300 unit doses here for idiopathic. So there really was a significant difference here in terms of providing quality of life improvement once you hit the 100 unit uh, dose for idiopathic patients. So there is some sort of method there in terms of how those those doses were determined. Complications that we have to warn patients about before they have botulinum toxin injections. We have to warn them about period procedure UTI, so we could give a patient a UTI, transient hematuria, um, urinary retention, and systemic weakness. So we have to sort of be aware that there is sort of a black box warning for botulinum toxin injections for systemic weakness. This would be case reportable uh, for a detrusor injection for bladder. All right, what about sort of how often does UTI and transient urinary retention actually happen? If you look at the literature, you'll get numbers all over the place. So for UTI specifically, looking at the literature, you'll get studies that quote anywhere from zero to 56% uh, rates of UTI after receiving botulinum toxin injections. And I think one of the main problems here is that there is a lot of confusion, even amongst urologists, between sort of not understanding that asymptomatic bacteria does not equal symptomatic bacterial cystitis. So we have patients who are chronic, chronically colonized, patients who may not have baseline documentation of their colonization status, and these patients are being included in the UTI category when in fact they just sort of had asymptomatic bacteria. So that's, that's, that's where you're seeing elevation of those UTI rates. Um, this is areas ripe for research. You know, we still need further research looking into how we can standardize peri-procedure antibiotic protocols for patients who are having botulinum toxin injections. So looking for future projects. Um, and what about urinary retention? I think this is the, the thing that patients get most concerned about as you counsel them for botulinum toxin injections. Again, you look at the literature, there's quite a range, two to 35%. And obviously this is a hodgepodge. This is, these are not sort of oftentimes pure patient populations. There's idiopathic neurogenic patients, so you have to break that down. Um, and it's important to know that an elevated PVR does not, does not equal urinary retention. And that's why it's so important to document that baseline PVR. You know, if a patient comes in with a baseline PVR of 150 and after Botox they're at 200, well, that's not really, that's not a clinically significant difference there. Um, likewise, I have most of my patients, uh, my practice is idiopathic OEB female patients. So if I have a 65 year woman who has, you know, a baseline PVR of pretty much zero, we do a botulinum toxin injection and she comes back to me uh, for her check afterwards. Um, and she's got a PVR of 200 to 250 milliliters. If she is asymptomatic and she doesn't feel like she's having a hard time emptying, um, she doesn't have voiding symptoms or a sensation of incomplete emptying, I'm not worried about it. That's just a reflection of the botulinum toxin efficacy that will go down over time. And we're just gonna watch that. We're not going to intervene. So having a baseline PVR on your Botox patients is really, really important. Okay, so let's just take a quick minute here talking about augmentation cystoplasty. Um, this is a procedure that has really been reduced by the introduction and widespread use of botulinum toxin injections. Um, but it's still important to know about, and, and, and a number of you may have had experience with uh, augmentation cystoplasty along the line. So this is when all else fails, right? This is sort of moving on from third line therapy. This would be kind of considered fourth line. The goals here for augmentation cystoplasty is we want to disrupt those coordinated detrusor contractions. We want to mechanically provide an increase in the bladder capacity. So you're trying to sort of recreate a low 
uh, pressure system, a low storage system, low pressure storage system that a patient used to have for their bladder. The key here is patients have to be willing to catheterize. If they're not willing to catheterize, then you're looking at sort of a different reconstruction option. All right, so contraindications. Some of these are absolute, some of these are relative. So intrinsic bowel disease, Crohn disease, radiated bowel, other, there's typically ways to work around that. Um, obviously conditions that would put patients at risk for a short bowel syndrome, um, you'd want to avoid those patients. A reduction in manual dexterity and cognitive function. So again, these patients have to physically be able to catheterize and they have to have a cognitive wherewithal to remember and to know how to catheterize. Um, so a quick little schematic here for those of you guys who may not have gotten to do an augmentation cystoplasty in the operating room yet. So we're using terminal ileum. We're taking about 35, 40 centimeters. And the most common way of doing this is sort of detubularizing that ileum, creating this inverted sort of U patch on a pedicle, clamshelling the bladder, opening up that bladder, and sort of, and obviously just sort of sewing that patch on and creating that mechanical increase in bladder capacity. So there's a host of complications ranging from metabolic disturbances, stone formation, perforation, um, and malignancy. And so this is obviously patients who you don't want to just operate on and send away. You know, those are patients you're going to definitely follow um, forever, and they're going to have sort of a long-term relationship with these patients. I just want to sort of throw in this, this trial here. This was a great trial that sort of looked at this large urology, multi-specialty urology practice out on the West Coast. Um, and they looked at almost 5,500 patients who came in complaining of overactive bladder symptoms. And what they found is that less than 5% of their patients made it to third line therapy. Um, so it is just really, and this is back in 2018, I think if you did the same study today, I think you'd find the same numbers, you know, just two years later. So it's important to note that even though patients come in and they may fail first and second line therapy, we really have to do a better job of getting these patients to third line therapies. So. So let's just do a quick little summary and then we'll go do a couple quick cases and I think we're still okay for time. All right, so obviously you wanna make the correct diagnosis and treat the correct issue. So you wanna make sure you have an overactive bladder patient. Um, now this may sound silly to you guys who are mostly sort of used to doing inpatient work and maybe not as much in the outpatient clinic, but this is actually a key point. You wanna make sure that you know what you're treating, um, that this is not just a stress incontinence patients in disguise. Um, so you really wanna make sure you're treating overactive bladder symptoms and that's their primary bother, uh, the patient's primary bother. Don't forget to go through the first and second line therapies, behavioral modifications, and oral medications. I have a number of patients who get referred to me for third line therapy, and they've never gone through these basic steps. Um, so don't forget to go through the treatment algorithm. Again, we have three great options available to us for refractory OAB patients. We've got PTNS, with, with perhaps even some really exciting options down the road for home therapy. We've got sacral neuromodulation with some sort of interesting technological advancements coming down the road, and even here with axonics now and botulinum toxin, which is going to be a mainstay of OEB treatment. So again, sort of know what you're treating, offer appropriate options, and start discussing third-line therapies early on so patients know that if they don't do well with the medication, that there are other things available to them. All right, you guys, so let's just go through three quick cases um, just to kind of give you an idea of how important knowing your patient is, not just for OEB, but for everything that we treat, um, but how important it is to know your patient and sort of and, and work with them to pick the most appropriate therapy. Okay, so first case here. 72 year old woman who lives in an assisted living facility comes in complaining to you of urgency, frequency, urgency incontinence. She's tried behavioral therapy. She gave up her tea, which she loved. And she's also tried Miravegron. In terms of past medical history, she's got some hypertension, hypothyroidism, and some cognitive impairment at baseline before she meets you. She's had a coli in the past, nothing, nothing crazy there. In terms of medication, she's taking denipacil. So the, the trade name for that is Aricept, which you guys may be more familiar with for cognitive impairment, metoprolol and levothyroxine. She's a widow. She has, um, you know, she's in a pretty competitive bridge group at her living assisted facility and her OEB symptoms are really bothering her in terms of quality of life. And she loves a good reason to get out, to get the van, to drive her over um, and to, to the office and for any reason to sort of leave the assisted living facility. So if we think about sort of what's the next step, you know, what might she be an ideal candidate for? Well, I think about, you know, Botox, you could talk to her about a botulinum toxin injection and be sure that she's willing to catheterize. That might, that might spook her. Um, sacral neuromodulation, now you have to make sure with cognitive impairment that she understands the therapy and understands how to use the program at home. Um, that's a key sort of component to counseling a patient for sacral neuromodulation. Or you have PTNS. So in my mind, this is my ideal PTNS patient. 
they, it's a, they have baseline cognitive impairment. We don't want to go through this anticholinergic regimen with her and worsen her cognitive impairment. She's got all the time in the world right now to come into you once a week for 12 weeks. And in fact, that little bit of TLC and placebo effect from getting you know, the nurses to talk to her and ask her about her OAB symptoms might be therapeutic in itself. So I would say this is a great candidate for PTNS. Okay, let's go on to case two. So this is a very busy 54-year-old male executive. He's got urgency and frequency, which has failed to respond to behavior modifications, mirror background, and psilocinicin. So that's it here. Um, he has just hypercholesterolemia. He's relatively healthy. He's only had an inguinal hernia repair in the past. He's taking a turbostatin for his cholesterol. He is married to his job. He travels frequently for work. This is the patient where you walk into the room to see him and he's on his phone. He's already talking to a, you know, he's got a work call that he hangs up on because he says his doctor's here. If he's complaining perhaps to the medical assistant because you're running 10 minutes behind in the office because he's busy and he's got to get out of there. So what might be a great step for him? Well, he, he is a, he's a busy individual. He doesn't love coming into the office. He would be a great candidate for a really long-term therapy. Um, so I'd be thinking about sacral neuromodulation here. He's tech savvy. He's going to understand the technology. He might even be a candidate for a rechargeable uh, sacral neuromodulator. And he could, if he has a successful implantation of a sacral neuromodulator, neuromodulator, he might not have to come into you for quite a long period of time, you know, an annual visit, an annual check-in, um, and that might be the best suited option for him. So he can get his therapy, have efficacy, see you later. He doesn't have to come back to you repetitively. All right, and let's just finish up here. What about this 44-year-old woman? She's got baseline urinary retention requiring CIC. She also has urgency and urgency incontinence episodes between her catheterizations. She's been refractory to behavioral modifications. She's tried and failed oxybutynin, tolteridine, mirabegron, and she comes to you for help. She does have multiple sclerosis, no previous surgical history. She's on an interferon beta for her MS, uh, for maintenance, merit, uh, maintenance medications. In terms of social history, she works at a call center and she only has predetermined break time. So she can't just get up to go to the bathroom whenever she can uh, whenever she feels the need, um, she, or she can't catheterize more frequently than what she's doing now, which is four to five times a day. And she finds these urgency and condoms really distressing. She's young. She doesn't like having to wear sort of in a, di a diaper on a daily basis and have episodes of incontinence. So what might be a next best step for her? So she's a neurogenic bladder. She's already catheterizing. You're not worrying about putting her into retention. So in my mind, she would be a great candidate for botulinum toxin injection. Again, you're not worried about retention. You could definitely start at a 200 unit starting dose for a neurogenic bladder um, and give that a shot and sort of hope to, to sort of modulate her detrusor of activity and get rid of those urgency incontinence episodes between catheterizations. All right, you guys, a couple minutes for questions um, and then get you guys back to sort of where you need to be in real life. All right, thanks, Dr. Murphy. Um, we had a couple questions, one from Dr. Blavis, um, who writes that um, OAB patients with voiding symptoms, uh, in some cases, even women have urethral obstruction. Um, so he's asking about why would you not do a Euroflow and residual urine in, uh, in some of these OAB patients? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, again, sort of a, a Euroflow and a residual, if you look at the AUA guidelines, you, you don't have to do that for your idiopathic, um, uncomplicated OAB patient. But anyone who has any sort of neurogenic bladder coming in, or any degree or hint of sort of concomitant voiding symptoms, um, it, or, or any type of concern for allo obstruction, then yes, a Euroflow and a PBR would be an appropriate part of your initial evaluation and certainly your evaluation as you get to the point where you're refractory. So disclaimer, so I do that for all my patients. Um, I don't usually have a lot of the straightforward, you know, off the street. I just, I just started having OEB symptoms, uncomplicated, no concomitant voiding symptoms. Um, so all my patients actually get a flow and a, UV, and a PBR coming in. So I totally agree with you, Dr. Blavis. Yes, it's an important part of the, important part of the evaluation. Um, and then somebody else wrote a question. Um, I think they were talking about the rechargeable battery. Um, and they were wondering if, you know, a patient forgets, doesn't charge it. Is there a time frame? Um, during which it may cease to function, I guess, where it can't be charged again? That is a great question. And I have to sort of profess ignorance here because so Axonix is the only approved system right now that has rechargeable battery. And in full disclosure, I still use Enerstam. Um, 
um, and sort of waiting for that device to come out with a rechargeable unit. The way that Axonics is developed right now is you do a weekly, half hour weekly charging session um, with this sort of like this belt device that you can sort of put around your waist and you can, you can be ambulatory, you can be mobile, you can be walking around your house, apartment and sort of do a charging session. Um, so exactly, so what would happen, you know, when would you have complete decline and lack of efficacy? Like how far could you push the envelope? I yeah. don't, I can't give you a great technical answer there. Okay. 